I'm Ricky Lima, writer and creator of Undergrowth, the new graphic novel from Top Shelf Comics, and you are listening to the True North Country Comics Podcast. Welcome to the True North Country Comics Podcast, dedicated to promote Canadian comic book and graphic novel creators and supporters. I'm John Swinimer. On this episode, I chat with Ricky Lima about his new graphic novel, Undergrowth, and more. Please like and subscribe to this website by hitting the subscribe button, so you'll be notified about new podcast interviews and article posts. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, YouTube Podcasts, and YouTube Video, so please follow and subscribe to the podcast and video feed of your choosing. Ricky Lima is a writer and educator from Brampton, Ontario. He enjoys writing interesting stories and helping people. Ricky is known for his previous work that includes Happily Ever After, Black Hole Hunters Club, Huma Am, The Millennium Bomb, Kickboxer, The Unauthorized Adaptation, Calder Magazine, and Soda Pop Pirates. He's exhibited, paneled, and attended many conventions and festivals promoting his work, including the recent Small Press Expo. Ricky's new graphic novel, Undergrowth, features colorist Yulia Shvetsova and illustrator Danielle Aquilani. The story of Undergrowth goes like this. The world is being ravaged by four terrifying robotic monsters. One fateful night, four friends venture out to watch a meteor shower and come face to face with Doom, only to find that their story is just beginning. Returned to life by a mysterious natural power, these young adults are chosen to bear the only weapons that might turn the tide against the invaders, ancient, towering forest entities, which they can pilot from within. They're enormously powerful. But when you're struggling with the trauma of your own death, is that really the best time to become a living weapon of mass destruction? So without further ado, here's my chat with Ricky Lima about his new graphic novel, Undergrowth, and more. So, Ricky Lima, thank you very much for taking time to chat with me. No problem, man. I'm always a big fan of the show. Seeing you at cons and stuff is great. Finally a guest on the, the show proper. I'm very excited. Well, I, I must apologize for that. But yeah, we have been talking for on and off at conventions and festivals and all sorts of stuff. But I'm glad we're able to take this time and talk about something that's really substantial and something that really you should be proud of, and I'm sure you are. But before I get to all the questions, I would like to know, what was the first comic book you read? Oh, man, that's a hard question. So, like, very first comic book ever? Jeez, I don't know if I could ever, I don't know if I can answer that, because I don't remember. But I think the first comic to ever make an impact on me was the uh, Maximum Carnage run uh, in Amazing Spider-Man. I remember thinking Carnage was, like, the coolest character in the world. And uh, reading that Maximum Carnage series, I was like, this is crazy. This is, like, nuts. And then they made a Super Nintendo video game. And I was like, whoa, this is crazy. And then uh, Carnage appeared in the animated series. And I was I was like, man, this is the best. So to answer your question, that's probably the first one I remember reading. Uh, it made an impression on you, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. it. So lots of stuff for inspiring young minds. I'm wondering what inspires you to create today or who for that matter? I mean, that's a good question. I think I think I write mainly for young ricky i think i write stories that i think young ricky would be like yo that's that's a wicked story you know what i mean so like i i feel like i'm my own audience you know what i mean i'm trying to impress my young self but i think what inspires me to keep creating and keep writing is all the other media that's out there and sometimes you'll see something that's like not done well or the execution is not you know not quite there and that really inspires me to take that idea further and figure out why that didn't work, what I could do to make it better. Or even if there's like a story that I see and I feel like there's an element to that story that's missing, or I feel like there is more to explore within that story. I, that really inspires me too. And I, uh, I'll, I'll kind of expand on that and then, you know, develop my own ideas. And also too, I think what inspires me, I'm sorry, John, I'm giving you like eight different answers. No, here. it's great. But, <laughs> But I think also, too, what inspires me to create is the idea of like a conversation between me and my audience, because I don't I don't think I can articulate myself very well 
when it comes to just conversations with people. I'm often like, you know, just cracking jokes constantly. I'm often not taking things too seriously. It just, you know, just having a good time. But when I get into stories, when I'm when I'm writing comics, I feel like then I can express my ideas properly versus just in a regular conversation. So that's kind of the three things that really inspire me to keep creating and to keep trying to make these connections with the stories. So, I mean, you know, hopefully I can continue doing that. And hopefully, uh, hopefully I'm not a one hit wonder, John. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to definitely not. Really book. Definitely anyway. not with all the stuff you've been working on since, yeah. uh, gosh, since I, I can remember meeting you, you've got a lot of stuff on the go. Whenever I go to a table, At one of your shows, there's a ton of stuff on there for people Uh, to look at. One of the ones that you have right now, I'm sure, at your table, uh, wherever you go, is your new graphic novel, Undergrowth. So mm -hmm. I want to talk a bit about that. For someone who's not familiar with that story and that book, how would you describe it to them? uh, Well, I tell people it's, uh, well, okay, I've had people describe it as like Power Rangers, but with organic mechs. And, you know, I mean, fair enough. They, They get into giant robots. But uh, I tell people it's about these kids who are uh, on a planet that's being invaded. And one night they're killed by the invaders, but brought back to life by the spirit of the planet and given giant organic mechs to fight back. And, uh, you know, it kind of deals with mental health, the trauma of dying and coming back to life and having to save a planet, stuff like that. So uh, that's like the general overview of it. But, you know, there's a lot going on in the story. It's like 300 pages. There's a lot of people dealing with trauma and dealing with uh, bad situations. And, you know, I would say that the mechs, the giant robot battles is kind of a metaphor for life. You know what I mean? So so it's an action book, but there's more to it than just the action, you know? Yeah, that was cool. Those people can get a lot out of it. Uh, during That's the what meeting. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Now, I was looking through my notes and actually on my site, there's a picture of you holding up a version of Undergrowth yeah. back yeah. in 2019. Is yeah. that version the black and white cover? It looks like it. Yes. Wow. That's so... That I was very eager to get this book out back in 2019 because <laughs> after Happily Ever After, I, I didn't do mm-hmm. anything. And I was like, man, I need a new book. So so that book is technically an ash can, even though it's like a pretty big book. And so it has about like half complete art in it. The lettering is like pretty much non-existent, is pretty garbage and is printed on like cream paper that I printed at Coach House when I worked there. So it's a, you know, it's a pretty rough book. I remember actually... When I released that book in March 2019 at the Comic-Con, I remember hearing some people being like, why is Ricky charging money for this uh, this really bad book? I got a little bit of flack for that. I'm not going to say who was, who was giving me flack, but there's some people who are like, I don't know about this book, man. This printed pretty crappy. And I was like, look, man, I just want to get this book out there. So, yeah, that was back in 2019. That was like five years ago, man. It's crazy, right? <laughs> it's crazy, but I'm sure anyone who bought it then probably has a collector's item now. But <laughs> you never know. Uh, first, people have to care about the book, and then yeah. the collector's item. Well, but is that actually the precursor to what people have today? That's for sale. Is it is it the initial concept, or is it was it being flushed out as as you produced it back in 2019? Yeah, I mean, when that came out, we weren't even done the first issue. Like it's just like rough pages and i was probably starting to write issue two by the time that came out so yeah it was like really really early on in the process i mean it hasn't changed since like it changed the art got finished but the story or even the panels i think we changed one page and that was it but uh from that it was pretty much what it was yeah that's cool now you mentioned we so i want to talk about your collaborators Mm -hmm. can you mention who they are and and how they helped you yeah, so uh, the artist, Daniele Aquilani, he's the uh, artist. He's from Italy. He's got like a degree in comics. His dude is like the best. If it wasn't for him, this book would not exist, obviously. And then uh, Yulia Shetsova is the colorist. So the, all the self-published versions that you've probably seen don't have colors. And we brought Yulia over and she did the colors. And they're amazing. So good. Elevates Daniele's art like 100 times. So great. And then um, Andrew Thomas did the letters. So you probably, you know, Andrew, right? Absolutely. The fat man who letters. That guy pretty much letters any indie book that comes out in Ontario. He's a good guy to know. That's for sure. Yeah. So what about the collaboration process? Uh, Typically, I ask uh, creators, like, was it like, here, take the script and run with it? Or it's like a page by page thing? Or how did it work out for you? Yeah. So I write my scripts page by page, and then I outline the panels. 
But I make it very clear to the artist when I'm working with them that it's not set in stone. So I'm very open to them changing anything if it feels like they can uh, add to the pacing of it, add to the storytelling of it. Because for me, collaboration in comics is like the biggest thing that uh, I feel like that is comics biggest benefit is the collaboration. So it's very important to me that whoever I'm working with is able to, you know, explore their own ideas within the story and explore like their own storytelling through the scripts that I write. And then, you know, he'll uh, he'll draw out the thumbnails before he starts doing the inks uh, or like the final art. I'll go through the thumbnails with the script that I have and make sure that everything kind of fits. If things aren't quite working, um, usually what I'll do is change my dialogue not necessarily ask them to change anything in terms of pacing. Uh, I think maybe sometimes they'll be like, oh, you know, it'd probably be easier if we switch this panel or or do that. But for the most part, it's usually the writing that gets kind of rejigged once, once the thumbnails are done. And uh, yeah, I mean, so I'm, I'm very open to like collaboration and that's my favorite thing to do. So it's very open the process. You know what I mean? Usually I'll finish a script, give it to them, and I'll be like, I don't want to talk about it until you're done. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. I know that we were talking about seeing you at festivals and conventions, and that's what you're doing right now. You're well on the road. You're you're just at Small Press Expo, and you're wanting mm-hmm. to know a little bit more about your plans for promotion for the book. Will you be attending any more festivals or conventions as well, the year goes yeah. on? Yeah, well, that's the crappiest part about making a book, you know what I mean, is the promotion. And not because I don't like talking, like, I love talking to people about the book, and I love connecting with the audience about the book and stuff. It's just, there's not enough time in the day to talk to everyone about it. And there's not, when when it comes to promotion, you realize that a lot of people have things going on in their life. And it's like, I feel real bad being like, hey, you should buy this book even though the world is on fire. You know what I mean? So I feel I feel real kind of bad sometimes when it comes to promotion. And, you know, you don't want to get annoying. You don't want to tell people to keep buying your book. And then they're like, all right, I heard you shut up. And you're like, well, but did you buy it, though? And, and so, uh, so promotion definitely is the hardest part of the job. But it is a lot of fun. And I do like talking to people. So uh, after SPX, I have two library no three library shows coming up there's the Whitcalf in whitby the oshawa fan con in i mean oshawa and then there's the mississauga comics one in mississauga so i'm going everywhere man and then there's one in brampton i don't know when but i'm sure it'll be soon in november probably i don't know they haven't said but other than that i don't have too much planned I, i'm thinking of doing like a one month launch like a personal thing, but I haven't planned that out and it's actually coming up soon. It's October 3rd. So I should probably start planning that and promoting that. But uh, other than that, I think once the book is out, you know, just going to try and enjoy it, I guess. Yeah. I want to go back though to your comment about, you know, the world burning and you're trying to sell a book, but it's not like you're in the grocery aisle and you're trying to push your book you're actually at places where people want to buy books you're at festivals conventions bookstores so naturally people are looking for books and why not yours yeah fair enough but i think at the end of the day the nature of social media now has become like my instagram is basically just comics and you know i'm fine with that like i'm fine being the comics dude and like promoting my books because i feel like you, like I said before, that's like my way of connecting with the world. But, you know, I don't know. It, it's tough online, especially to just keep bombarding people with advertisements or things to buy your book. You know what I mean? And it's like, you know, the economy is garbage. We, nobody got money, but I guess everyone needs stories, though, still. Need an escape, I think, is what we need. And, and your book yeah. is perfect for that. Thank so let, let's move on to advice. I usually ask creators about advice because everyone at these shows comes up and say, look, you've made a book. Tell me how to do it. What's your secret? So what's one piece of advice you'd pass along to someone who wants to make their first graphic novel? I think my piece of advice would be take it slowly. I mean, you use the term graphic novel And I I would say for someone who's starting out to not do a graphic novel, do something like really small first, like an eight page, 12 page story, 
see how you like it, see, you know, how, how the whole process works. And then even if you have an idea for a graphic novel, don't do that yet. And just keep making the single issues, keep making the small issues. Uh, and eventually, I mean, you will have something bigger. So if you could break your graphic novel down into like small chunks, that's probably the best. What I did with Undergrowth is it's eight chapters. I released eight single issues as we went. And that really kind of broke it up. And I, that made it an enjoyable experience because, you know, you're constantly working on it and you're constantly making progress. And I think that's important too, uh, like physical progress, because I would release the issues after they came out. And for me, that was very important because it was something I was working towards, right? So I wasn't working towards this goal five years in the future. I was working towards this goal that was three months in the future. And so that really helped me with the momentum and help working. Uh, and I'm sure for Daniele too, like that probably was great for him. I mean, he was working mainly throughout lockdown in Italy. So I'm sure he appreciated having something to look forward to as he was going. Yeah. So that's the biggest thing is take it slowly, break it up into chunks. And I think the second biggest piece of advice is just keep trying. Oftentimes we can get very discouraged when we sit down and write and nothing comes out and you're like, I wasted my day, but you didn't, man, because you tried and you got to keep trying. So you got to sit down the next day and try again. Eventually, I think your brain will get so fed up with nothing happening that the brain will just be like, all right, fine. Here, here's an idea. Take it. And you're like, oh, sweet. Thanks, brain. <laughs> and eventually it, it gets done. So you just got to keep trying, man. People get, uh, you know, they they stop too early, I think. OK, very interesting. OK, well, that's good advice. Yeah. I, John, for you, with this podcast, you've been doing it for a long time, right? Oh, gosh, 2017. But it's only yeah. out of ignorance that I do this. I well, said, well, you know, <laughs> well, I go, what do you mean? well, I, I said, do Canadians make comic books? I had no idea. So then I started yeah. asking questions. And I started finding people like yourself at these festivals. Come in, just going, you're a Canadian. Oh, yeah, you make stuff. So, and mm -hmm. I just want to share stories. That's what's all Did you ever about. think you'd have this many episodes? No, never. I <laughs> <laughs> I I do it because this makes my day better, and I hope it makes people's days better Dude, by listening that, to it. That's a very good point, too, because I find myself, if I'm having a crappy day, I'm like, well, at least I can go home and work on my comics, and mm. that will make me happy, right? And yep. so that kind of like really minimizes a lot of the crappy stuff in life because I know that I have good stuff coming up that I can really kind of latch on to you know what i mean and so i'm okay with certain things being crappy because i know other things would be pretty good which at the end of the day will make it more difficult when you're struggling with the writing because you're like well now the good part of my life sucks but if you could break through that and just keep trying you could benefit from that i think you know okay cool oh good good stuff good advice so i don't know if this is a, a better question or we'll just continue with that negativity but uh, <laughs> there's a lot of artificial intelligence being bantied about in the news today especially being used to make art so i want to get your take on ai being used to make graphic novels and comic books what's your thoughts oh man that's a tough question man i'm not like anti-ai i don't think that I think AI has its place. So I'm talking specifically about generative AI. I think when it comes to like analytical AI, like analysis of like, you know, cancer cells and stuff, 100%, let's use AI. I won't even, if they find a drug using AI that saves lives and people are like, well, you didn't actually, scientists didn't actually analyze. It's like, shut up, it's saving lives, whatever. You know what I mean? But when we talk about generative AI, I mean, then you kind of fall into these you know, is someone actually making these things? Is it, you know, is it copyright? Is it, is it creativity involved in it all? And I think as long as you're not selling that work or you're honest about what you're creating, I think it's okay. And I think that, well, even selling, I think as long as you're honest about it and you're selling it and, you know, let your audience decide if they want to support that or not. But, you know, I'm not going to sit here and be like, well, you're not an artist. Get out of here because, you know, whatever. But I do think there's a certain kind of dishonesty about using AI, maybe hiding in that fact or using AI as a way to not pay people. I think it's very crappy and I don't think that that's right. So, yeah, it's a very complicated thing. And I, honestly, I, I think that just like. 
AI in general, like the art it produces is pretty garbage. So you're not, even if you're using AI to produce art, you're not really producing anything that's like pretty good. Cause I, I always hear the the phrase, like if you don't take the time to care about your art and make it, why, why should I, you know what I mean? So it's like, mm -hmm. if you can't even take the time to draw a picture, I, I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, why should I care? You know what I mean? Right. So, I mean, it's tough, man. I think AI has its place. I certainly, when AI was like starting again, buzz, and I was very excited. I was using it and I was like, well, that's really cool. But then you're kind of like, all right, well, let's get some real stuff going, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Well, thanks for your input. I have an AI DJ who talks to me. How do you feel about that in terms of podcasting in your job? Well, I mean, some people, and I have heard it, and and we've actually seen it in technology where it's, if you're talking to someone and you want it to transcribe automatically, I know a lot of reporters are using it today and it's actually in the iPhone doing it quite quickly so they don't have to go back to the office and listen and type. Mm -hmm. I can see some benefits there. However, I don't think the dialogue that you and I are having can ever be replaced with an AI. And I'm putting my foot down on that. It should <laughs> never be, right? Like sharing ideas, discussing ideas. Like if someone down the road comes up with a podcast and it's like a, a robot talking to you. I, I don't see the merit in that, you know, no. that, that, but that's just me anyway. <laughs> yeah. And the yeah. fact that you need humans to model the AIs after, I think really kind of shows that humans are necessary even at the end of the day. You know what I mean? That's right. That's right. We'll, we'll tell that to Arnold when he comes for us. That's right. <laughs> so we've been talking about undergrowth. I want to know what's next for you. Do you have anything on your writing tablet that you're working on right now? No, man, nothing. I'm done. Comic <laughs> is, I'm game over. Comic. No. Now you're joking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's tough. It's like, yes, I'm working on stuff. But also, too, I feel like it's like, man, like, when will I ever rest? And it's like, you know, the honest answer is never. But some days you're like, man, I should really take it easy. But I never will. So right now I'm working with a Brazilian artist, ALK, on a book called... Uh, Soda Pop Pirates. And that's like, uh, it's so new. I barely have a good pitch for it. It's like vampire adjacent pirates who get powers by eating people, but they don't want to eat people anymore. But the eating people is keeping the boat alive and the boat is the captain's father. It's crazy, John. There's a lot of going on in that book. It's kind of uh, wild. I know. Right. And then so that one, that's usually the way I work is like I'll have one like stupid project and one good project that I'm working on. And so Soda Pop Pirates is like the good project. That's like, you know, that's legit. And then on the side, I'm working on a book called Kickbox or the unauthorized uh, adaptation. And I think Shane actually talked about it on this podcast, too. Mm -hmm. I, I listened to his thing. And it's an adaptation of the Jean-Claude Van Damme movie Kickboxer uh into a comic and you know i had a lot of people be like why the hell are you doing that like well what what and um the idea is that i wanted to learn more about the mechanics of comics so by taking the movie taking stills from the movie translating them into comics like using screenshots from the movie in the comic uh, I'm able to kind of analyze uh, comic storytelling and kind of figure out pacing figure out how things look on a page versus on a movie. Uh, and then also, too, like as a side thing, you can analyze the movie using itself. You know what I mean? So there's elements that you focus on in the in the in the comic that maybe don't exist in the movie. But because you're putting in a comic and you're you're spotlighting it, you can kind of see it in a different way. You know what I mean? So it's a very interesting exercise in, in storytelling because just by focusing on something else and seeing it through the lens of of me and the lens of the comic is all of a sudden now it's different. You know what I mean? That's kind of exciting. So how do you tell the story? And in Kickboxer, there's a lot of problem, like not a lot, but there's some problematic stuff in it. So it's like, all right, well, how do you deal with that while still being faithful to the movie, being faithful to the, the story, but also criticizing those kind of elements? <coughs> 
Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, it's very, very intriguing what you're doing, because typically we have seen these movie adaptations that are pretty much knockoffs that the studio says, yeah, just get something out quick. Just get this one issue out so we can put it on newsstands. But we really don't care about, you know, what you show or whatever. Just get the the basics. But what you're doing is you're actually analyzing each frame for the most part and the story itself. So it's a little more in depth in what you're doing, for sure. Exactly. Trying to at least. And, uh, Mm. you know, it's tough, but I've done four issues so far. Uh, the fifth issue I'm working on right now, and there's only going to be six, so I'm almost done. And it's been a year and a bit, so uh, oh, this is crazy, man. So, Ricky, with everything you've got going on with your books and your travels and all this stuff, where do you recommend people go online to find out about your current and your future projects? Yeah, I think Instagram is the best place for me at king.k.rule. That's uh, R U L E. And, uh, yeah, that's, I post the most there, uh, Twitter barely ever post there. LinkedIn. Why would you add me on LinkedIn? That's mainly a professional thing, (laughs) but, uh, yeah, I think Instagram is the best place to find me. Is there something I didn't ask that you'd like to get across in this interview? Hmm. No, I mean, this is pretty thorough. I mean, I really enjoyed talking to you about all this. I want people to pick up the book and enjoy it. Uh, that's my biggest concern. Please. Go pick up the book and enjoy it. And then let me know what you think of it, even if you hate it. I want to know. Thanks to Ricky for the chat. You can discover more about Ricky Lima online at limepressonline.com and on Instagram at instagram.com slash king period k period r-u-l-e. And thanks to you for listening to the True North Country Comics podcast. Please like and subscribe to this podcast by hitting the subscribe button so you'll be notified about new podcast interviews and article posts. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, YouTube Podcasts, and YouTube Video, so please follow and subscribe to the podcast and video feed of your choosing. You can follow along at True North Country Comics on most social media sites, and you can send any and all feedback to john at truenorthcountrycomics.com. Thanks for listening, and come back soon for another episode. Bye for now. Truth Country Comics podcast is copyright Truth Country Comics, copyright 2024.